Charlotte had a great temper, an enormous and wonderful temper. Charlotte could really, really get pissed. She come like a hurricane of volcano to the room, <laughs> do something, scream something, and disappearing. Charlotte was funny as hell. She had a very sharp wit and beautiful humor. And at the same time, she was dead serious. She was so concentrated in her performances. She was so effervescent. She could interest anybody within a radius of a mile in her ideas and make them love it. Charlotte had this absolute irresistible quality. Even Port Authority couldn't say no to Charlotte. <laughs> she had this great vision that art should be very public and that art should be kind of free. Charlotte is always Charlotte Moment, whatever she plays with. She plays with a voice of John Cage, it's Charlotte Moment. And she's very Monroe like, you know. Uh, performance. It's, she herself is interesting, you know, and bow movement is just, uh, you know, mm, uh, accessory. Charlotte had been a serious cellist. It was curious that a woman who, after all, played all the classics uh, and uh, played for a maestro such as Stokowski was really going out on, shall we say, a limb uh, to participate in a uh, in this avant-garde movement. She became known as the topless cellist. That was the piece that made the front page. And it's too bad because she did so much more. In 1967, on February 9th, she um, scheduled to do a piece that created by Pike, which was called Opera Sextronique. That was the flyer. She's holding a cello, getting ready to perform the piece. And she's wearing a, a, the underwear. Ron Panties. The composition, an avant-garde work by Nam June Pike, specified that she played topless. When I played the piece in the uh, concert hall, they uh, they listen and they watch and they like it. It's um, the, the police that get upset. The audience at the West 41st Street Theater came there by invitation only. Except for the police, they came with official badges and arrested Miss Charlotte Mormon for indecent exposure. I think it made a big splash in Arkansas paper, and then mother was crying, you know, and that. Uh, and then, you know, it was a shame for the whole family, you know. Well, my family is very upset about what I'm doing. They wish I'd go back to Bach. They feel that they wasted uh, their time in encouraging me uh, toward an education. And, and in fact, they feel I'm disgraceful. She was tried before a uh, magistrate or a criminal court judge a couple of months later. And after a trial of a, a couple of days, with a lot of testimony on her behalf, the judge came out with a uh, decision which found her guilty. Judge Shalik asked, what size of a cello she played. And she says the child, or Charlotte had the largest size of a cello. Then that is also increased her criminality, you know, because you have to spread your leg wider when the cello is larger. Understand? Is it an uncomfortable instrument? No. It doesn't look so terrible for a lady to play one of those, I think. It feels good. Does it? Uh, Found her guilty, but uh, suspended sentence. After her conviction, they called Rasprovovich, which in Washington then. Mm -hmm. What do you think about his conviction? And he said, I, I side with judge. She should be put into jail, and not because of indecent exposure, but for unfair competitions. Understand? <laughs> she was on the list of approved classical performers, uh, paid by the Board of Ed to tour the schools of New York. It was a fairly good part-time job and she was taken off their list of approved musicians because of this conviction. She was doing stuff when you could still shock people, you know, and then uh, that's not possible anymore. Edgar Varez, a great composer, uh, once called me Jean d'Arc of New Music, then others think I'm an idiot. She didn't like being no known as the topless cellist, and yet she would exploit it. When she was on the Johnny Carson show and the, these other television shows, for example, sometimes fun was being made of her and she would go and she would still do it. You know, she was still saw it as being important to be in front of a big audience like that, which she couldn't have gotten to otherwise. They laugh out of embarrassment or our lack of exposure or whatever, that's really not my problem because I have to play the piece as well as I can and I'm, I'm so busy with all the, the various things. These pieces are hard. 
and in the cage piece where he's written the uh, string part and all these other sounds, if I don't do it at the right point with a stopwatch, then it's like adding a beat to Boccherini. It was never nudity for the sake of you know, flaunting anything. It was never for the sake of eroticism. Mm -hmm. It was nudity as part of a costume, as part of an expression of freedom. Well, the funny thing is that when she did a topless performance in New York, that was the one thing she did not invite me to. And I'm just wondering whether she thought I was too much of a square or something. It's kind of embarrassing to, to know that she went to such great lengths to attract attention. It may not have meant attracting attention to her. She may have just thought of it as a real art form. Her early years, she was pointed towards being a southern belle. She was in a beauty contest in Little Rock, where she won. 1952, Miss City Beautiful. Somehow they lopped off the E of Charlotte and they censored out the R of Mormon, so you get mm. Moomin. Well, she was a southern belle and I was a Tokyo buzz or whatever. <laughs> and we kind of, you know, uh, we came from a, a similar background, shall we say, in that sense. And uh, we were idealists. Charlotte was the sort, a, a very attractive, smiling little girl, round-faced, eager to please. And she would stop by after class. I had her in an English class to say something or other to me. The reason I remember her so well is because she was lugging her cello off and on the bus every day. This is the 1951 picks when we were seniors. She was in the National Honor Society the Southern Airs, which was a girl's social club, and a bookstore monitor. She wore very dark lipstick, and that was unusual in that day. She was extremely bright, very intelligent, but very reserved, guarded. She did not frolic, at least in school. Charlotte was the only person in La Rock High School that I knew that had a risque dress. And it was perfectly straight in the front, long sleeve black velvet. But the whole back of it was out. And in 1951, that was a rather risque dress for a high school senior. And I wore Charlotte's dress in the senior play. Charlotte wasn't what you would call in. And the cello was sort of a funny instrument, you know. And I can remember too, her hairstyle, she wore a pompadour when, when they weren't being worn, and a snood, if anybody remembers snoods, they are those little crisscross things that hold your hair up. I don't recall anybody else in Little Rock High School wearing a snood. Charlotte had a walk that was, has been described as a, a gate when she would go down the hall. That was very purposeful. And obviously, she was going places. The Charlotte Mormon. <laughs> Little Rock was just too small for Charlotte. That's, that was the feeling I got. Charlotte was going to float down the main street of Little Rock. And to do this, there were power lines blocking the tethers of the Heliumville balloons. So. Uh, Charlotte was so well known at that point, and they, I think they were so proud that she was from Little Rock, even though she did things that I'm certain were pretty scandalous to the people that knew her when she was growing up, or her family, and they moved the power lines out that afternoon, and uh, the parade went down, and Charlotte was, was leading there, having a, a great time playing the cello, floating in the air. So Charlotte was in the air, and police were taking people out of the fountain, and we were trying to dodge the nylon ropes of the repellers going down the building. It was like a good time was had by all. <laughs> I would like to say for the benefit of my mother and, <laughs> and my relatives, you know, because I do have a master's degree in cello. Uh, I went to Juilliard. I studied with the great Leonard Rose. But I met Nam June Pike. Pike, Pike, come here. They spurred each other on. Pike, we're rehearsing your piece. Pike, I think, was a, uh, you know, inspired by Charlotte, and Charlotte, you know, lived and breathed for Pike. Shake that, and then shout, son of a bitch, or something like that. Don't say such thing, but yeah, three, three at the Pike, you can. Pike, 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 Pike. Okay, then. Do I play cello? Oh, come here. Do I play cello or not? Later. There was a real case of art love. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
so there are two children of the New York of the early 60s who met and uh, and formed this alliance that was uh, to I think uh, you know com com completely catch the imagination of the art world worldwide because they traveled all over the place and uh, and, and, and shook things up. We're all good put in the goddamn jail, you know? That's true, we will. He was, not, um, he was not merely there to help her. He was doing his own artistic thing, and he could be ornery and uh, difficult, as she could to him. I'm dripping wet and so is the cello. David, I don't know what to do. He's not here. Oh. Sir, Maestro, could you find Nam Jin Pike? Why? Nam Jin Pike. <laughs> Tell him I can't move until he appears. She was really the muse for Nam and Nam did and really did a tremendous amount of work directed to sign uh, about inspired by her inspired by her energy by her uh, her daring darings and also humor Hi made the first new cello since 1600 he made three tv sets and a plexiglass case it's a totally new concept now i do not make traditional cello sounds with it i make tv cello sounds with it I did uh, see her when she performed uh, uh, with a brazier that was two, two television sets which uh, Nam Jung Pei had made for her and she played the cello. It was the first time that uh, uh, Guadalcana young people saw TV itself and first time on that first chance for the Shara, TV Bura, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's a real bubutu. Some of the work she has done uh, with Nachu Paik are some of the most important works of art, of avant-garde, of the 20th century. To me, uh, the avant-garde festival is her work, is, is her artwork. What she did was to give a platform for the avant-garde artists. I knew of her work both through my friends and through a, an extraordinary two-page spread in the New York Times, which made her into the uh, princess of the avant-garde, which seemed like the land I wanted to live in. Here's the one where she's underwater. This is a piece by Jim McWilliams, and it's called The Intervenous Feeding of Charlotte Marmot. This was based on her having had an operation earlier that year where she was on a lot of tubes. Well, uh, a friend of mine, Jim McWilliams, has already made me an ice cello and a chocolate cello. Hey, Peter Moore, oh. did you get a picture of them from the chocolate on me? That's chocolate. That is the chocolate cello performance. Jim uh, McWilliams did a lot of Charlotte's most famous pieces. The sort of the key piece that each have on guard What I was always doing with Charlotte was trying to create a visual phenomena with her. Because she, she was very beautiful. She did it in Edinburgh, Scotland for the Glasgow Festival. And she developed Frostburg. And we went to a pharmacist in Glasgow, Scotland. And she was saying to me, how can I tell him? I mean, how do I say it? I was playing nice cello, it was against my breast. We walked in and Charlotte said, blah, 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 you know, when I have this Frostbrite here. And sure enough, the pharmacist said, uh, how did you get it? And Charlotte said, my husband and I were making love up in the mountains at night and it was freezing cold. <laughs> right? I swear, it was just perfect. I suppose when she played the chocolate cello, she was nude for the chocolate to go on her body. But uh, actually, she didn't appear nude all the time. Mostly what you remember is chaos and hysteria and um, a real skepticism that this could, in, by any, any uh, stretch of imagination, that this thing could actually work. What really was somehow able to make it work was the fact that she would ignore that there was such a thing as a financial factor. She was very naive and uh, um, but wise. I mean a lot of people would have probably perceived her as being very shrewd because she accomplished a lot but it was a very naive beautiful 
loving force, you know, and that's what kept her going. When I met uh, Charlotte, I was public affairs director for the MTA. I said I would see if I could help in persuading the lawyers and the bureaucrats and the engineers uh, to um, um, accept uh, the um, festival for, for Grand Central. And the whole station had decorations and streamers and dancers and mimes and all sorts of things. She was really creating the, the, the atmosphere, atmosphere yeah. of things to be realized, to be happy. But not in the army. Not army. Total she was not, freedom. She was, she was not type of museum organization mm. or some kind of these French curators who, mm. who have their pencil thing. She really was keeping everything in um, continuous improvisation, changes. There was a whole army of people, her regulars, that would show up for those festivals that would think up for work for a year to have stuff ready for her little unveilings of them. When she wanted Shea Stadium, uh, she had to have, she actually moved the New York Jets, I guess it was the team, out of Shea Stadium for the day. I wanted her to be on a flying trapeze. And this was at Shea Stadium. So I contacted somebody who built professional circus flying trapeze rigging. We had the cello on one swing, and Charlotte was brave enough and drunk enough to get up on the other swing, sit there, and we pulled her back and forth, and she lashed out and played the cello. I had to twist some arms to get the passenger ship terminal. It was very touching that Charlotte dedicated that uh, festival to uh, Evelyn and me. I didn't go to the Floyd Bennett Field when this was in the middle of the fiscal crisis and I was press secretary to the mayor at that time. I got a call from Charlotte one day and she said in her drawl, Sid, I, I need the salt spreaders from the sanitation department. We want to do an orchestrated ballet. I, I said, who's going to pay the drivers? <laughs> I said, there are things I can do for you and there are things I cannot. That one, <laughs> we're not going to do. She did Sky Kiss with me. I did Sky Kiss with her. And she brought the title into this collaboration, and I brought the, the know-how to make her rise high. And the music became more intense with every time we did Sky Kiss. She said there was nothing she enjoyed more than rising in the sky with the possible exception of sex on occasion. She found places that uh, really were enlivened and made put on the map by her activities, by her, by her festival. And she finally would get some sort of minuscule grants from various government agencies. And they were totally underfunded for what they achieved. I mean, there was a, a big bang for a penny. So they made use of Charlotte, you know, as a vehicle. But they didn't give her any money, you know. She was constantly I mean, really starving, you know. Starvation, no. Every meal was a problem. Every taxi ride was a problem. When I met her in the first, first, I think, afternoon or second afternoon that I was working with her, I was totally saddened by her story that she was suffering from tumors and that she was being treated for them and that they caused her from time to time a great deal of pain. She was dying uh, for several years, uh, you know, with incurable cancer, and we, nobody thought of it as a... Uh, incurable with, with Charlotte because she had this kind of uh, uh, determination that uh, was, uh, the sickness was a pain in the ass to her, but not uh, the, the end of the world. I refused to think of her in that sense. I never connected her with her illness in a way because she ignored it. Her cancer afflicted her for probably a dozen years before she died and caused her to have to stop the, make, uh, producing the festivals and limited her touring so that she was a great presence, but how she might have developed had she kept her health, you know, we'll never know. The Charlotte had a different rhythm of life. She lived mostly at night. I only know two or three other people who called as frequently in the middle of the night. She was notorious, let's say, if she had a plane to catch. She generally was at least 24 hours late for an airplane. She's always late, you know? And then if people wait and get impatient, Show must be damn good to recapture, you know? And none of Avangel piece is that, that good. Yes, she had to build attention, she had to build the energy, she had to build the situation in which she had to perform through the ear or the needle. It was that tense and it was that um, 
intense. This was Charlotte's room in the Paris Hotel, and this was the day she was moving out of the Paris Hotel. This was the afternoon of the day when she was supposed to be out by midnight. <laughs> I opened a closet door, and instead of clothes, all these bags of um, uh, scraps of fabric fell out. A whole closet full. And I said, well, maybe we can put these in the garbage. And she said, no, you can't. Uh, those are all the scraps from all the performances of Yoko Ono's cut piece that I've ever done. Oh, yeah. And I'm saving them for Yoko. Charlotte always kept um, doing my work. And she's uh, kind of told me that, you know, remember your roots. She was big on heart. She would. She'd send out Valentine's Day cards and New Year's cards with hearts on them. But, you know, if she got around to sending them out, I mean, a Valentine's Day card might arrive in August. Uh, and certainly, um, one of the th we found huge amounts of mail and correspondence on its way out that just never made it out the door. One day I got a letter in the mail from Charlotte, and on it, there was a stamp with John Cage's picture on it. Well, I was really surprised because I had never heard of this stamp being issued. <laughs> so I said to Charlotte, what, what, where did you get that John Cage stamp? She said, I printed them up. <laughs> I said, Charlotte, I think that's a federal offense. <laughs> she said, no, it's a federal offense that they haven't put out a stamp for John Cage. Oh, she says, I'm going to give a concert at Carnegie Recital Hall and, and I absolutely need a chimpanzee and I particularly would like to to get one that is well known and I said well I think there is a chimpanzee that went that went up to space and uh, maybe uh, you should try to find out whether you could get that and she said oh she thought that was a very good idea I said to her child how are we going to get an eight she said not to worry and an eight showed up on opening <laughs> with his trainer from New Jersey Charlotte had great style, so, and she was, and she knew quality. She had this thing about wearing real concert dress, and you know, not not demeaning it uh, by dressing casually. You know, she treated mm -hmm. it as a real concert. She loved to perform. Charlotte loved to look like Charlotte. She loved her gowns. She would ask sometimes in that performance, or oh, when we do that, can I wear a gown? Charlotte was always needing money, and I said to Charlotte, "You should create an object that you could sell." and then you'll have money. And she said, my God, why didn't I think of it before? And so with an art dealer, they, they did this uh, multiple object, and they sold like hot cake, and suddenly Charlotte had her own money. It was like a miracle. This is a picture of Charlotte and me embracing at a dinner which the Low Manhattan Cultural Council held honoring me, and as part of that, I was able to designate um, an artist, a deserving artist, uh, for a uh, grant of $10,000, and I designated Charlotte, who was then quite ill. Uh, she, in turn, gave me the neon cello, but her memory is more important to me, because once you knew Charlotte, uh, you, know, you no longer forgot her. I remember in working with her, it wasn't long before I began to hear about how she was helping this or that artist who was having this or that kind of trouble. Uh, bailing people out of jail on drug wraps or, or helping people with alcohol problems or penniless people. I don't mean she was the mother, but she had that self-sacrifice yeah. feeling. Yeah. Always self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice. Mm. You know, she was, uh, she was giving herself so much. You know, probably this is one of the most generous person we ever know. She was calling from her hospital bed and they were prepping her for the surgery and she wanted to have the operation filmed so that it, she could be part of the performance. She said that's the only way she could get through psychologically this operation. The hospital said no, the doctor said no, uh, nobody wanted it. Uh, she wouldn't take no for the answer. So I went in and we did a 16 millimeter film of her biopsy in the, in the surgery room. After the operation, Yoko Ono sent a bonsai tree uh, as a gift and uh, Frank carrying it in scratched his eye with the twig of the tree and tore his cornea and Charlotte called me from her hospital bed uh, one day after surgery 
saying that she thinks Frank's in more strength than he, and, and she is. And she told uh, her physician she wanted to visit Frank in the hospital. He said, yeah, if you, you have all these bottles and drips and you know, equipment, he says, you, you need a, a, an ambulance to take you. He says, well, I'll get an ambulance. And he said, well, you, you can't, I can't, I, I wouldn't order it. Well, she got Yoko Ono to send a limo, and believe it or not, she went to see Frank at Manhattan Pioneer Hospital. That's the kind of gal she was. If you, if you talk about Charlotte, you cannot leave Frank out. Because without Frank, Charlotte wouldn't have physical existence since 1970 or so, you know? He was her nurse on a really, on a 24-hour-a-day basis, and I mean that because she could not sleep through the night. She had to, with, during a number of the last few years, she needed um, injections every several hours. The guy's sweetheart, you know, really, to everybody. She fell in the Grand Canal, yeah. and they had to go and give her a tetanus shot, and the doctor in Rome said, how did you, you know, oh, the tetanus shot then forced her to blow up and her tooth and a swelling of the mouth and this and that. And the doctor said, my God, what happened to you? And they didn't want to say, Pike accompanied her to the doctors. They didn't want to say that she had gone into the Grand Canal because it's part of a composition. <laughs> so Pike said, Pike said, I hit her. Since Dr. Pike is in Germany, my husband, Frank Pelleggi, is assisting me with the piece right now. I think Frank was just sort of, at times, worn out by, by dealing with Charlotte. I mean, Charlotte could be uh, a real energy drain. Frank was a, a very dedicated man and a uh, marvelous uh, person. And there was just this time where, you know, I think he was started, he was wondering about his own life, his own, his own identity and things of that sort. I think finally he just gave it up to her which was an enormous gift for somebody to give to another person. He died about a, about a year and a half after she did. He died. She, she died in the fall of 91. And Frank died in June of 93. Very suddenly had a heart attack. I've increasingly seen Charlotte as somebody who was more than uh, an effective and provocative or evocative clowning avant-garde performer. I feel that sometimes uh, she's seen too much as a kind of neo-data person from the 20s. She was way beyond that, somebody who would really um, expand an art form. She had a, a certain energy and a uh pizzazz about her that few possessed, and, and, and a spirit. I mean, she just was determined to play what she wanted to play, live the life she wanted to live, and, uh, and she never compromised. She was always concerned uh, to make the art of the present important in its time and to bring it to the largest number of people. And the best way to remember Charlotte is to practice what she preached, which was to let no barrier uh, prevent you from making your dream happen. I thought that was symbolic of her life, even though she might have been broken. The pieces were all growing as a memory in each person's soul. And uh, one day we're going to bring it together again. Soul Loft in 1965, performing the performance of a work by John Cage. Miss Moorman is a cellist from Little Rock, Arkansas, who once was a regular member of the American Symphony Orchestra. I will always be the mother and dad. I will be extra careful. Eventually, somebody will make a movie.